Hello. Hey, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a long awaited interview with Rachel Lampert, who directed Lee in her one woman show called Objects in a Mirror or Closer Than They Seem. We are actually approaching the 11th anniversary of this production, which took place in Ithaca, New York in February of 2010. The play began on February 12th, if I'm not mistaken, and it mm -hmm. ran the 12th, the 13th, and it ended up concluding on the 14th, which happens to be Valentine's Day, which of course was Lee's birthday. So I'm very, very happy to have you here talking with me, Rachel. It's really an honor. It's a pleasure to be talking with you and especially talking about Lee. So we'll get right into it. Uh, let's introduce you to the audience. You have so many credits and you're so accomplished in so many ways. So let us hear from you about, you know, the things that you founded and, you know, what, what you're doing. Okay. Um, well, uh, for the first part of my career, I actually ran a dance company in New York City that was called Rachel Lampert and Dancers. And that was, I did that for 17 years. But after that, I um, moved to Ithaca kind of following my husband. And I had always been a writer. I wrote um, plays and I wrote musicals in addition to my dance work. And when I followed him to Ithaca, there was a job at this very small theater called the Kitchen Theater Company. And the theater was at the time, I didn't found the theater. It had been um, going for about five years, but it was in really critical difficulty. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of, a, kind of on its last legs in many ways. And um, it had though a wonderful, a very small but very excited audience that was interested in seeing pretty much anything that was new and exciting. They were not interested in, you know, one more production of an Arthur Miller play. And so it seemed like a really great place to be. And they were struggling to find an artistic director. I'm one of the few artistic directors that actually someone said, do you want to do this as opposed to applying for the job? Uh, and so I took it on in 1997 was my first season. And um, it, was a, it was a big struggle to keep it going, but the art side of it was really uh, always in place. And we just built an audience from there. And I was there for 20 years and retired in 2017. And if you wanna know what fits and starts productions is, I always have written musicals for young people. And so I decided when I retired, I was 69 when I retired, that I would uh, continue doing something that would keep me busy, but not have the huge responsibilities of running a, a theater full time. So one of the things at the kitchen that was really critical to me was that I had kind of come up between the dance world and the theater that I was interested in New York City in what I would call the downtown scene in New York City. And uh, that was, it was really important to me to connect with artists that were doing original work. And particularly I was interested in the artists who also performed their own work because I, that was one of the things that I did perform my own solo pieces. So, Lee, Lee came through a director who had met her in New York City. And originally, uh, this director lives here in Ithaca, and she said, I've met this wonderful woman. It was one of these kind of speed dating kind of things that they used to have, where playwrights would sit at a table and li literally tell the directors, this is my, this is what I'm doing. Right. I, don't, I think you're referring to, this is bringing up a memory of the Dramatist Guild. Yes, and I think, I think the Dramatist Guild was hosting this. And I remember her being very excited and mm -hmm. going off with her little manuscript. And she was saying, you know, I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to find a director or, you know, there's an opportunity to be matched up with a director. 
Right. So the the person who was sitting on the opposite end of the table lived in Ithaca and she met Lee and then she knew that we did a series that we call the Kitchen Counterculture Series, which was um, uh, committed to work that not that it wouldn't be on our main stage, but we knew we were building an audience for this kind of work. And it was a lot of work of artists of color, a lot of work of women artists. And um, and Daphne, who brought the play to me, said, oh, I think that you'll really love this. So I read the play and I thought this Lee would be great. I spoke to her on the phone. She wanted um, more time up here with us than other people because she was still really developing this play. And mostly what we had been doing is what I used to call art in the box. You know, like this is the, a, a solo artist who has toured this piece many, many times, comes to Ithaca, <laughs> unpacks the box, does the play for us for, for a very um, concise period of time, and then leaves. Lee was asking for more development time. So um, that just seemed like an exciting thing. I mean. We were, most of the artists that we were working with were a lot younger and I kind of at the beginning of, of their careers. Here was this established actress who, you know, we all <laughs> knew and had grown up with in certain ways, you know, from her work on television. And she was going to come to our community and be with us for a while, which meant a lot to me. And I thought, we'll figure out, figure out how to do this. Did you know of Lee before this introduction by Daphne, had you been aware of her work? Only her work, I mean, I, when, I, when I looked at her name, I said, oh, this name is familiar. So when I looked up, I said, oh yeah, well, I know who this person is because, you know, like I'd seen the King Lear, you know. Oh, you had. I had, yeah, because I was there, you know. <laughs> That's one of the things we did. And I had certainly knew what the electric company was. So I was- Well, King Lear goes back to 1974. So between 1974 and 2010 is quite a span of time. Yeah. And yeah. there's not so, that many people that I know of who, well, ended up working with her, at, you know, at, at some point later, other than the actors, obviously, in that play. You're, that's, that's, for me, that's a very cool piece of uh, information to know that somehow there was an intersectionality there that ended up <laughs> bearing yeah. fruit, you know, literally decades later. Yeah, well, I think it's just so interesting that when, when you're in New York and you can go and see theater like that, like, like uh, that, production of King Lear that everybody was dying to see. Um, and I, and I, was, uh, I was already out of college and I was, you know, just taking in the theater scene. So I did get to see it and then putting that together, she, she seemed like a, the, just the right person for us to invest some time and energy in, in a new way, which was beyond what we usually did for the artists that came in counterculture. Now, as it turns out, um, it didn't quite work out with her and Daphne. Uh, so um, there was, and we were definitely not going to scrap the project. So I said to her, I would be happy to take it on. She was very happy to have me take it on. And so I delved further into the play much more than I had as being the producer. I'd read it a couple of times, but now as the director, I had to go much further into it. And I'm guessing there must've been a time crunch <laughs> <laughs> There's a learning curve, you know, um, and we, you know, we weren't sure, uh, I, you know, I reread it this morning, I have to tell you, I read, I read the script this morning, um, and I was once again incredibly moved by it, and, and thought about, about all the additional things that we could have done, you know, had, had we been had more time with it, but um, she was so game, first of all, she knew it. I mean, this was her work, her writing. And so she, it was in her, it was totally inside of her. So we didn't have to worry about, didn't have to worry, like technically did she know her line, she did. We just had to talk about what story she really wanted to tell. And I think that was the most dramaturgical work that we did. Like she started it off with the daughter and we ended up changing the order a little bit so that other thing, and uh, this rap uh, mama would start the play. And I think I was most helpful to her to kind of, 
as a without any agenda, just saying there you have a lot of threads going on here. And when I read the play again this morning, and the only copy I could find was the one that we hadn't um, chopped up because I couldn't, uh, it was actually, I found it in an old email. Um, I'm, I'm remembering how it was interesting for her to hear from a, from a director and doing the dramaturgical work saying, I, I have to follow this story and I have to follow this thread because there's a whole thread about Sierra Leone. That's a that's an that's one long story, and the daughter story with all of her relatives, both in the south and in the north. So um, we worked a lot on how to figure out the best way of telling the story. And the thing I loved about her was she was just so open to it. You know, I wasn't like sometimes. I mean, I write too, and I have we work with directors, and sometimes they'll tell me what they think and then I'm kind of no I don't want to do that she was really really open to it and was willing to work hours and hours and hours on it so we could try it out you know we had given ourselves enough time let's try this order and see how that feels um because she'd lived with what the transitions would be from from moment to moment because she's playing so many different characters yeah, well, let me let me stop you there, uh, just to give people that are watching this video, because you know you you know it as a director. So, I found this wonderful article in the Ithaca Times, and it says that there were originally nineteen subjects in this play, but the, she had adapted it down to seven characters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. I mean, I can say as an audience member, uh, having really only seen it that one time, this was a play that she'd worked on for at least 10 years, this one woman show. And I remember, you know, watching it and her going in and out of all these different accents and ages and locales, really on a bare stage, the only prop there was maybe there was a chair I, I seem to remember a chair and just the lighting so it was very stark in the way that Shakespeare plays are often very stark and I was just fascinated with the complexity and how could she keep <laughs> track of and remembering all these different stories and all these different parts and going in and out of it uh, dealing with death, dealing with the subject matter of death and just war and just how society, societies, I guess I can say, because there's also many geographical locations in this play. So the name of the one woman show is Objects in the Mirror Are Closer Than They Seem. So back to you as a director and her openness to work with you. Well, we we spent a lot of time trying things out. We made How much time, of, actually. We had about two weeks before, and and uh, I have to say, my thought was, first of all, because of her age. Second of all, because it was a one person show. Mm -hmm. That you know, the usual rehearsal time for for a regular show, we'll, we'll, you have an, a a seven hour day, and there's a break in the middle. But when it's a one person show seven hours a day is very few people can do seven hours a day. So usually you plan, it's about four hours. And after that, it's just such concentration of like the director and the actor being on something. But we work longer than that. <laughs> we would like, we'd have a session and then she, I need a break and she'd take a break and go back to the hotel and then she'd come back and we work some more. So there was a, just, it was just a, there was time for us to really hone in on what we could cut, what edits there could be, so we would shorter play, and also really, really get very specific about each of those characters that she was trying to tell us about. So and were so you doing story, seven hours a day? We were doing, I would say we were doing six hours a day at least, you know, which is a lot more than we thought. and. And it was fine. I mean, uh, we had, luckily she was in a hotel that was like 
you know, a block and a half, you know, stones throw away. So she could like go home, take a nap if she wanted to. Um, I never left the theater in those days, so it didn't matter. I could just be there all the time. And so we we ended up with something that was quite, um, quite um, changed from the thing we started with. And I think she was really happy with what we what we ended up with. And one thing that we we looked at a lot was to try and find whatever humor was in the play. And I I read it in reading it again this morning, I was reminded there's a character named Sarah Ann, Sarah Ann Mays. And she is like, she's a young character. She's a teenage girl. And Lee put a lot of humor in her. She's kind of like, she says things, she says what she means. She's, you know, she's she's trying to get into music and art school. She's very, very positive and forward thinking as opposed to the daughter who's very, which is kind of the point of view of the main, that's the main character. And, and that was kind of from Lee's point of view, uh, who's who wants to move her mother's burial place to a place that she believes she really belongs. So she's got a journey there that's quite serious and she has to convince people to help her and she has to decide who she doesn't want help from. And so, but she did put in this other character. And I just remember saying to Lee, we have to give them some relief from this because it, the story is, is a, it's a deep, very profound story. And a lot of um, talk about uh, slavery, a lot of talk about um, uh, this, and, and again, reading it yesterday, reading it this morning actually was so interesting because we hear the history of this family that has white members and black members, and there's a reunion. It feels so today to me. It's so, uh, it's, I didn't realize until I reread it how kind of ahead of her time she was to even have that conversation about ancestry in that way. So, um, and I think because she was so convicted that this was a story that needed to be told, uh, she wasn't waving any flags and saying like, you know, this is a story everybody needs to get woke to because it was not, that wasn't what people were saying in those days. It was just a story right. she needed to really tell. So, because um, I read a lot of, right. a, a lot of work by um, uh, playwrights of color. And this is a topic that's very, it's so current right now to talk about this shared ancestry and this, I mean, the scene that she has where she talks about like white George and black George, you know, and they're all in one related family because they go back to slave days. Um, it's, a, it's a, you know, I began to watch, have the movie of it go in my head today. I was thinking about like, mm. this is really, um, so it's got it's got threads that I think could be pulled to make a, a whole other kind of script, but we had we had a really great time and I learned a lot from her because of what was in that play because as a as a you know in a white New Yorker, you know that's not my heritage and it's not my experience, and Lee was sharing it so openly, and also allowing me to say to ask questions. And I would sometimes ask, you know, fairly naive questions because, you know, I'm sort of the face of the audience. I have to say, though, that, you know, her, her show sold incredibly well. I don't know why it sold that well, because the counterculture did not necessarily, we were trying to build an audience for that, for that. But it may have been that people knew who she was, may have been that we blasted electric company all over the place, but it sold really well. It brought in more people of color than we had ever seen in the theater up to that point, mm -hmm. which was really, that was, you know, one of the things we were hoping to do because we wanted people from our neighborhood to come in and that the, the theater was not always feeling as welcoming as we thought it should be. Um, and we would have these great talkbacks after every one of these shows. So Lee was great at that. I mean, she was great at hearing what people 
had to say, and the audience is very opinionated, you know, like, well, I didn't know. I, got, I was confused because between such and such and such and such. And she said, well, you know, maybe that confusion is okay because by the end, did you know where you were? And the said, yeah, I do. Well, good. You came on my journey with me. You know, she was really, um, she was a good subject for people to to hear from because she could be articulate about her play and she was incredibly humble about her play she was also strangely humble about what a spectacular actress she was i mean that was you know <laughs> that was just so surprising tell, to me. tell me about it <laughs> tell me about it yeah she she really well, you know, I guess, you know, she was just very invested into the craft of acting and always felt there was room for improvement. And that's one of the things that I'm really glad that I, that I learned from her or that I absorbed from her. And it, it may be, I'm not sure, but I used to think that maybe it was a generational thing of that time of people that were born in the 30s. She was born in 1938 and growing up through the depression, the 40s and the 50s, where there was still this idea that whatever you were doing, whatever kind of work you were doing, whether you were a carpenter or a chef or a singer or an actor, whatever it was, a construction person, it was a trade, it was an occupation, and that ultimately you were a servant of the craft. The craft was not a servant of you, that you were a servant of the craft. And because you could went into it with that feeling, you know, when there was more of a, when there was just, I think there was just more of a service mentality and more in, in some ways, in spite of the racial tensions and ugliness in this country, uh, still, Un underneath that people had more of a humility and there were certain standards you know there were things that were expected of you you know whether you were playing in a, a big band or not that she really carried you know throughout her whole life and that the theater the theater was a temple the theater is a temple and that everyone has a role to play within this sacred space but that the space was sacred and that the space ultimately required one's humility and one's allegiance to that cathartic experience. Yes, very that's well. What I learned, that's what I learned from her. Yes. Yeah, well, she certainly, um, you know, <laughs> People don't know what the kitchen theater looked like in those days. We we now have a, a much there's a much more beautiful theater that we built after that. Um, in fact, that that was the year that we were just beginning to um, start to get ourselves ready to move to a new theater. Oh, in 2010 was your year to move yeah, forward. That, okay, that um, that September we started the we moved into the new building, um, but our little theater was 13 feet deep. 24 feet wide, audience on three side. There was never a place in the floor that was didn't have a little creak certain places, you know, as you stand over here. Um, <laughs> the ceiling was only 11 feet high. It was it was uh, this this little hole in the wall. And so, and oh, I it always- was more than a hole in the wall, <laughs> trust me. I've been in holes in the wall in theaters with her. That was better than a hole in the wall. Well, she was so, um, she was very gracious about like what that space was like because it, you know, it was not a, not a beautiful theater with beautiful seats or, 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 or even an adequate dressing room. I mean, it's still when Lee, when Lee was there, I think we finally had um, a dressing room that had of, of bathroom facilities for the actors so that you didn't have to use the um, audience's bathroom. But she was there in the winter time. So there's oftentimes it was frozen back there. So I don't I don't remember all those details. But she came in here and she kind of looked around and went like, oh, this is where I'm going to do my work. And that same actress for me could have easily been walking onto a stage of a Broadway house. And 
done the same thing. And she just treated our space like this is exactly where I want, where exactly where I want to be doing my play. And she made everybody around her um, want to work very hard for her to make to make the play happen. And that was also really great. And she, you know, she spent a lot of time talking to me about how we had built the theater in terms of getting support for from the community. Um, because we'd started out, it was so rough at the beginning. And by the time she was there, we were already in the middle of a capital campaign. We were, you know, we seemed, we had our legs underneath us. And she talked a lot about what she wanted to do with her life in terms of helping other playwrights of color to have opportunities to do their work. And she did come back to talk to me about being uh, going to France and starting this this playwrights retreat, and I have to say I thought, oh my God, this is this is an impossibly large project. This cannot be done. I mean, because she looked at me as very entrepreneurial and you know understanding the business side as well as the art side of it, and um, I looked at her and she would tell she talked about this project and I thought. No, this this I don't know how you st how how will you do it, but the more she talked about it, the more I, I remember talking to Leslie Green. I said she's going to do this, this is going to happen, and when it happened, I I can't tell you how excited it was. It, it was so exciting for for all of us at the kitchen to know that we had actually pulled it off, and that she was there, and that she was producing, and that people were coming to see plays that didn't exist before Lee gave a, a, a place to give birth to it. And I, I do think that her experience at the kitchen helped solidify that goal in her. And I, I've always felt so great about that because I was not, I did not jump on her bandwagon and go like, yes, you've, that's what I said. Oh yes, that's a fabulous idea. Like, how the hell is that going to ever happen? So right. um, it was just so great that it did happen um, and that she managed to make that, to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. She thought you were terrific. You were definitely uh, a great source of inspiration, you know, for her and that, you know, come on, let's face it. You're like another woman who went to some place which previous to you as far as I know wasn't renowned, renowned for any theater or you know and managed to bring something back that was on the brink and turned it into you know something viable and something thriving and something that was that was flourishing and something that was growing um, and you know that again it just makes me think of the whole that whole talk back Part portion and just the the reciprocation the enthusiasm again I managed to get up there with uh with my friend Raymond uh and you know we drove like crazy we didn't realize it was going to be quite so snowy you know and and icy which slowed us down a little bit and managed to get to your house and drop off our dog thank you to your husband and then like, you know, drove or I don't know, we walked, whatever, we just, just like flew, you know, a, a, found the theater. And I mean, literally, I think we got in the door. I think we we're like probably about the last two people, you know, to make it into our seat. And I was like, right, we cannot miss this. This is the last night, it's our birthday. But I remember the audience members, I just remember them smiling. I just remember this, this love, you know, this kind of, uh, this is illumination and enthusiasm and happiness and just a lot of smiles back and forth. And I remember going back to her dressing room and no, it wasn't fancy, but it was clean. You know, it was clean and it was neat. She was the only one in there. She didn't have to share the dressing room with anybody else. And just how thrilled she was, it really gave her a lift because when you're working as an actress, you know, there's just, there can just be such long periods, you know, where 
where nothing happens. And of course, she had made this decision to make a transition from, you know, being in front of sort of the boards to writing, because of course it was also very important, as you pointed out earlier in this discussion about ancestry and shared ancestry and, you know, uh, you know, black and white or people of color relationships, you know, with the, with the, with the other half, you know, with the other family members acknowledged or not acknowledged um, to then, you know, kind of step back in front, you know, really born out of a kind of a bitter experience of having a really hard time, you know, getting uh, her play, you know, mounted in the first place. I remember, because of course, you know, I would, I would go to these things and I remember, you know, people that she, who had, who had known her for years professionally and, you know, men, the men, mm -hmm. you know, who just were so reluctant to lend their support so reluctant and we're not we're not encouraging and i just th remember thinking to myself you know this is a woman who is beloved by millions of people i mean she literally helped millions of people learn how to read for example you know what to speak of she was a working actress and what to speak of all the television shows she'd been on through the years and the films and television commercials i mean you name it you know she'd pretty much done it but it was out of that struggle you know that really made her want to create a womb or a space for other playwrights because she said this is too hard it shouldn't be this hard i mean i'm <laughs> yes <laughs> i know it shouldn't be this hard it shouldn't be this hard you know it just shouldn't be this hard well that's one so. of the things that was so nice about that particular series that we did when we did the counterculture series was that we could give safe haven to to writers who were um not as well known and who were still working out their work which was really helpful. And it also, um, for me, it helped the audience become educated about what the work of making something is, because you can't get usually the playwright of the existing play to come up to a tiny theater in Ithaca, New York. So, you know, Edward Albee's not showing up and, you know, Arthur Miller's not showing up and you know May they rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> They're not, you know, well, yes, they but at that time they were both <laughs> both alive. Um so uh to have someone who is a writer and able to be articulate about what they're doing and why they're doing it and the audience meeting them, it makes for me, the, the theater to be this living organism that is producing more and more and more and new things. And I think for the people who were unable to actually understand to be supportive of her, I think the genre in which she was working was so different from the commercial world. I mean, really, really different. And that, you know, now across the country, there are theaters that would be really interested in her work yeah you know, well it's also it who controls the marketplace i mean that's i think really yeah. came to light in the oscars nominations which has been you know now it's kind of a continuing conversation but there was the hashtag hashtag excuse me oscar so white right. and and oscar so white and oscar so male you know, where there's just really, you would think, you know, you like to think of the arts as being very open and very all encompassing and ushering everyone, you know, in. And you just now realize, well, when you go behind the curtain, you know, of the Wizard of Oz and you see who are the people that actually make the decisions, it's really a very small segment of the population I mean, they have the experience that they've had. Of course, certainly their life experiences are valid. But if that's all you have, you know, yeah. on on a on a board or on a committee, 
Yeah. It well, doesn't that was, make yeah. for a lot of uh, diversity or welcoming in other voices. And, you know, everyone tends to sit in their comfort zone as human beings. I think we're all guilty of that. But, you know, there's no impetus to go outside and explore because, you know, you're, you are catering to one particular audience and, well, it's working. So why, why do anything else? Well, one, one of the things that um, a small theater like the kitchen has going for it is that the stakes, the financial stakes are within something controllable. I mean, they, there, are, there are real stakes there, but there's also, um, you can be nimble, so you can make, a, uh, a, make decisions in an easier way. And I know that it, with my leadership, I, I knew that we one of my major efforts was going to be broadening and being more inclusive, both on the audience side and on the people who are on the stage side. But you have to make that choice. And one really good thing to know right now is that theaters all around the country are really looking for new leadership. So when I read American Theater Magazine, so many new arts leaders are women, are people of color, uh, that, that there's a real, a real sea change right now in looking to who, where the leadership is gonna be, because that's where the real change will happen, because that, as you say, that's where the power will be. So the people are making all those decisions. So. You know, if Lee were here right now, we could probably book her very well in lots of places around the country because people would want to, they, they, they enjoy the kind of breadth of her career. The fact, you know, you can be on an incredible PBS children's show that changes people's lives and on a soap opera and in Shakespeare in the Park and in all the television and other theater that she did another film and then have this change in your life and then decide to become a writer there's much more openness to that now than there was 11 years ago yeah. and that, that's a that's for me that's that, that makes me feel good i mean we've had to go the country's had to go through some hell in order to get to this place but it is, and it's happening like every time a job is is out there, the the people are really looking to change the leadership in lots of theaters. So it's it's um that's a really good thing that's going on in theater. Yeah. Yeah, well, things are generational, you know, someone's got to start it. But yeah, and she was always very uh interested in controlling our own images mm -hmm. you know when she won the the musical all those awards for her musical strutting that was mm -hmm. sort of another um oh what's the word i don't know kind of signpost you know along along that path of realizing how important it is for people to tell their own stories so their stories aren't just don't become distorted yep. which is what we see in the media so often i think i want to thank you for this i think that my time may be coming to an end here i'm not certain i think maybe because i'm the one hosting this meeting but i then again i don't see any timers so i guess maybe we should just <laughs> run with it a few more minutes or okay. you know i can try and you know launch it again i mean really i guess what i wanted to ask you is just about the after party and you know what questions you would have liked to ask lee if you could now because you've mentioned Jean Bond, who was very supportive of the Playwrights In Project. I also want to mention Lenny Kravitz, who was very generous in his support. And there was other people too as well. But if you could be a fly on the wall. <laughs> well, I had the unique experience of, I wasn't a fly on the wall because I was at the dinner table, but it was me, Steve Nunley, who was the managing director of the Kitchen Theater, and Jean Bond and your mom 
having dinner together, a very long dinner. I mean, we went out for dinner and it was probably three hours. And hearing about her life as a young person, hearing about Jean's life, hearing about their friendship, um, I, I, I felt like I was getting an education in an aspect of our country and the people of our country that I am not as familiar with that was so wonderful. I mean, Steve is, is a man of color. And so he, but even he said, oh my God, Harlem, Harlem in those days, what was that like to live there? What was it like to be, you know, uh, to, to, to be who both she and Jean were as young, as young women and, and as young girls? So I think I'd probably want to sit Lee <laughs> down and get, the whole story of her whole life and ask her many, many questions about it. And then I think I'd really want to ask her like, well, what can we do to make more happen for you? Because I feel like she very generously gave other artists opportunities. I was glad that I could give her an opportunity, but I think now that I have time on my hands, I would be interested in finding out what she would want to do next and how to, how to maintain the things that she was, that she was, had really started. Um, yeah, well, so, I mean, that's a goal for sure is that I have, you know, objects in the mirror and I actually have some other plays of her, which I think would be intriguing uh, in, on what we were talking about the locale actually takes place in South Carolina uh, during slavery times. And it's, it's a, an interesting, perspective, but trying to get these things, I actually need to follow through, you know, with um, a place that the Dramatist Guild suggested about mm -hmm. seeing about getting these things published, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, available, you know, for distribution, you know, available to schools and universities and different people that would want as you say, you know, to do something like that now, because for the time being, you know, they're still typed on tight pieces of paper with like brass. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, you know, I know, I know. Page turners, <laughs> and I have just have been uh, a little, I mean, you know, if there's any suggestion, you know, that you might have, to get it into, I guess I have to get it in some kind of digital format, you know, first of all, scan these pages and have someone transpose them because that seems to be the way now. Yes, I'm reminded as you say this, that it was not on a computer. The script was not on a computer. And I remember the cut and paste version of, of making the script when we made changes. And I don't think we ever had, we didn't have like that, intern that we could point to and say type this and put it in put it on on uh into the computer so we can have it as a digital copy but um i do have i do have some thoughts because as as i read it this morning just a lot flooded back to me you know i i had i had forgotten just how interesting that play is and i've been um in my years at the kitchen i have much many many more connections with more people who are doing this kind of work so not in the course of this conversation but in the course of another conversation i would be interested in in talking to you about it and certainly dramatists getting them published would be really really terrific but there might be some steps before that where either departments in certain universities or some small theater companies might say oh yeah let let us let us look at this material at least. Like, I want to look at the play that she wrote that's about South Carolina. Cause that, okay, um, you got it. You know, I would like to read that. Um, I'll send because, it to you. Great, great. You know, it's, uh, it, it's always um, great to read plays that you know the author. And, uh, and I feel like with Lee, you know, we only really got together twice she came for that period of time, which was a couple of weeks. And then she came back again later on. And I'm gonna send you, Leslie found some photographs of her that's that, that I will send you, um, <laughs> that when she visited us. And 
it was just, uh, but it was just such um, a, a kind of strangely deep connection that we made in those two brief times, but we were working so intensely that I, you know, I never, she, I didn't have time for her to say, oh, here's my manuscripts of the other things that I've written, you know, we didn't have time for that. So um, yeah, send them to me because I, I will read them. I would like to. Awesome. Thank you. Wow. What a gem. Thank you so much. Thanks to Leslie for finding the photos. Yay. And uh, I've what can I say except thank you from the bottom of my heart. I really, really appreciate this conversation with you, Rachel. It's so valuable. Glad that we finally made this happen. And uh, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I love you back. And I'm so glad we made it happen. <laughs> so, and my husband says hello. He remembers you very well. So, you know, so he's he, he's been skulking around, around over here. He says hi to you. Hi. <laughs> All right, then. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone for, for joining us. And I'm going to end the conversation here, but to be continued in one form or another. Have a great rest of your day, Rachel. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Erica. Bye. <laughs>